Chapter 7, Hammering Out a Federal Republic. And the years we're looking at here is 1787, 1820. So we're post-revolution here. Uh, and you have this new republic. So hammering out a federal republic means you got to build it. You've got to build this country that, of course, you're claiming is like, like nothing before. Democracy, individual liberties, and so on. Uh, you know, definitely, like I said before, a monumental event. So there, there was shock around the world. You know, not only because the Americans won their independence from the big bad British, uh, no one expected that would happen, but also because of the style of government it proposed. <clears throat> so the intro page to your chapter says it very well. Like an earthquake, the American Revolution shook the European monarchical order, and its aftermath reverberated for decades. By creating a new republic based on the rights of the individual, the Americans introduced a new force into the world. Before 1776, a king who ruled by the grace of God had been the center around which everything turned. Uh, now the idea emerged that power should come from below, from the people. So from our very first lecture, we talked about uh, top-down history and bottom-up history and social history. That's what we're talking about here. Power emerges for the people from below. Okay. Okay, let's start uh, with a film. Please watch the Crash Course film, Where U.S. Politics Came From, and then come on back. Okay, so we're moving into a new era for us in this class. And, and this is a challenging but also glorious time as this new country and government began. And I talked about this in Chapter 6. It immediately split into two factions. And immediately you have political parties. And I mentioned that this was something that the founders were vehemently against. They, they thought this would be the, the ruin of this new country before it even got off the ground, that, that one of these parties would be stronger than the other and dominate and take over. Uh, <clears throat> but the separation of ideologies began in that day and it continues to this day. Uh, so I mentioned last chapter that this truly is the precursor to today's Republicans and Democrats. <clears throat> so in this chapter, chapter seven, we'll look at what's called the first party system. We'll talk about the French Revolution and how it was influenced by the American Revolution. We'll look at the Haitian Revolution and how it was influenced by the French Revolution and the effects it had on America. And I, I realize we've talked about both of those before. We're just going to review it a little bit because it's, it's pertinent to, to our story here. So this is an era of revolutions, all inspired by the American Revolution. So the American Revolution changed the world, there's no doubt about it. We'll also look at the Louisiana Purchase, the War of 1812, also known as the Second War for Independence, again, against the British. You just couldn't get rid of those guys. But let's talk about two very important men uh, in, this, in this early Federal Republic uh, era. Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. Uh, let's go ahead and watch our next film. Please watch the film entitled Jefferson versus Hamilton. This is an excerpt from the miniseries John Adams. And you see Jefferson and Washington and Adams and other very famous founders talking around a, you know, a table about, about things in general. And you can kind of see you know, the, the differences and the kind of friction that were between Jefferson and Hamilton. Two very different men with very different points of view. So go ahead and watch that film and then come on back. Okay, let's do a supplemental lecture here, number eight, and we'll call this Jefferson and Hamilton. Uh, this is number eight. This is the last supplemental lecture before the midterm. So, you know, again, you should be taking copious notes for each of these supplemental lectures. Keep these separate from your, your class notes. You can find them easy. Also, your outlines that I'm going to show you the our outline here next slide, but I've shown you an outline for each one of these. Keep all your outlines together, and you can use your outline and use your notes to write the supplemental lecture. So again, when you write your lecture, write it from the outline. Make sure you include everything that's on that outline. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> here's our outline. Uh, introduction, Federalist versus Anti-Federalist. We talked about that. Hamilton versus Jefferson. How the Founders Feel About Political Parties, we talked about that. Uh, comparisons and Contrasts Between Hamilton and Jefferson, Number 3, Twelfth Amendment, and Four Courses Relevance. So going back to number two, I'm going to post, I probably already have by this time, 
going to post uh, at, in, in announcements a, a document that compares and contrasts the, these two men. I'm going to go over it, it in this lecture, but you'll have a copy of it yourself, which you can also use for your uh, essays if you if that uh, if this is a choice and you choose to write about it. Okay. Okay. Let's get started here. Um, so as we know, these two political parties were formed from the beginning. The Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. So the, the Anti-Federalists, and not to be confusing, but this is the way it is. Anti-Federalists Federalists were also known as Republicans. Nothing to do with today's Republicans or Democratic Republicans. Uh, each party had a leader. Uh, the Federalists were led by Alexander Hamilton, George Washington's first Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, and then the Anti-Federalists, the Republicans, were led by Thomas Jefferson, George Washington's first Secretary of State. So when I say first, I mean that they're the first ones in American history that, that Washington was the first president. So Hamilton and Jefferson would dominate politics in this era up to the War of 1812. Uh, both men were powerful spokesmen for their differing points of view. So going back to this idea of political parties, and we, and we I, I read you the, the long and ponderous quote from George Washington last chapter. Washington warned that political parties would lead to formal and permanent despotism. So despotism or a despot, so what is that? A ruler who holds absolute power, but also who exercises it in a cruel or oppressive way. Uh, but even though George Washington warned against this, two of his closest advisors, Jefferson and Hamilton, formed the factions that led to the dual party system under which the U.S. operates today. Um, Hamilton and Jefferson came to represent the divisions from the beginning. The, the two men had opposing visions of the nation's path. Each had a different idea and direction that they felt the new country should go in. Okay, I'm going to go to this document. Okay, so again, I've I've posted this as as a uh, announcement, uh, so you could, you know, uh, access this yourself. Okay, so here's the, here's the kind of comparison and contrast. So let's start with on who should govern, and Jefferson's on this side, Hamilton on this side. On who should govern, Jefferson had deep faith in common people, especially farmers, but Hamilton believed that common people often acted foolishly. Uh, Jefferson distrusted special privilege, the elites, the monarchy, uh, the wealthy. Uh, Hamilton thought that rich, educated, and, and the well-born were the people who should rule. Uh, Jefferson wanted to lower voting qualifications, make it easier for more people to vote. Hamilton wanted to raise voting qualifications. So you see they're almost direct opposites it sits in everything. On the structure of government, Jefferson favored a weak central government, strong state governments. We talked about Southerners wanting to keep that, that state, states' rights and state governments being stronger than, than the federal government so they could keep slavery. Uh, Hamilton favored a strong central government. Jefferson preferred a more democratic government. Uh, Hamilton thought that the American government should be modeled on the British system that she had just defeated in a revolution. Uh, Jefferson wanted to reduce the number of federal employees. Hamilton wanted to increase them. Uh, Jefferson favored a strict interpretation of the Constitution. Hamilton, a loose interpretation. So, of course, a loose interpretation means you can kind of bend it the way you want it to go. Uh, Jefferson believed that individual liberties must be protected by laws. Hamilton, individual liberties such as freedom of speech should be sometimes restricted. Uh, on economics, thought that agriculture should be the backbone of the nation, so he's a southerner, he's a plantation, farmer, that type of thing. Uh, but Hamilton wanted a balanced economy of, yes, agriculture, but also trade, finance, and manufacturing. Jefferson did not support giving government aid to trade, finance, and manufacturing. Uh, uh, Hamilton favored giving government aid to trade, finance, and, and, fa and manufacturing. So did, one did not support, the other supported government aid. Jefferson opposed the establishment of a national bank. Uh, Hamilton established a national bank. Jefferson eliminated internal taxes. Hamilton maintained internal taxes. 
uh, Jefferson pay off the national debt. Hamilton used the national debt to establish credit on foreign policy. He believed that uh, Jefferson believed that America was obligated to help France. After all, they helped uh, America win the revolution. But Hamilton supported Britain, the parent country to him, the, the country that you, again, just defeated. <clears throat> uh, so look at these two parties, the Jeffersonians, the Democrats, the Republican Party, the Anti-Federalists, made up of artisans, shopkeepers, frontier settlers, small farmers, strongest in the South and the Southwest and on the frontier. So you're talking about rural America here. Hamiltonians or the Federalist Party uh, is urban, consisted of bankers, manufacturers, merchants, professional people, and wealthy farmers. And they have the most support in New England and along the Atlantic coast. So I understand this is a lot of information. I don't expect you to write all these down on your essay. So remember what your essay is about. It's, it's a synopsis. You're, you're you know, stating the main points. Some of these are very key. You might grab a few of those, but you don't have to do every one of these, okay? Okay, let's go back to our, um, our uh, PowerPoint here. If I can get back where I was. Look at that. Okay. Let me find... Okay, so so a, a, a key ingredient here is Jefferson believed that America's success lay in its agrarian tradition, agriculture, rural farms. Hamilton's economic plan hinged on the promotion of manufacturing and commerce in cities. Hamilton distrusted the will of the people and people in general, where Jefferson placed his trust in the people. Hamilton felt that cities were focal points of societal health. They were foundations for wealth creation, consumerism, the arts, innovation, enlightenment. Jefferson felt cities were great sores. Um, I'm talking about S-O-R-E-S, -E sores. Uh, Jefferson believed that centralized government was simply European-style tyranny waiting to happen again. We came over here to get away from that, and now it's going to happen again. Of course, Jefferson gained this point of view growing up in agrarian Virginia, living on his father's plantation. Uh, so he proposed a society of property-owning farmers who controlled their destiny, a republic focused on the yeoman farmer, uh, and a quote from Jefferson, keep alive that sacred fire of personal liberty and virtue. Of course, you know, reading between the lines, what what's what's key to this existence? Slavery. This is you know Jefferson's vision is completely built on slavery. Uh, he he's not he's not, you know, um, uh, identifying that. But trust me, that's 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 what this that his whole his whole plan is based on. Uh, Jefferson was against the manufacturing economy. It was driven by greed while while being a slave owner. Uh, he did not believe that promoting manufacturing was as important as supporting the already established agrarian base. Those who labor in the earth were chosen people of God. <clears throat> and I'm not sure who he's referring to, whether it's the plantation owners or the slaves that are actually the people that labor in the earth. He advised his countrymen to let our workshops remain in Europe and, and the north also. So what does he mean by that? Well, the Industrial Revolution is starting here, and you, you're moving from rural to urban, uh, from farming to industrial and, and mechanization and mass production and factories and, and all these types of things, and people you know, moving to the cities for work and working in a factory. And these factories were dirty and ugly and belching smoke and pollution, and the cities were dirty and covered with soot and uh, Jefferson's vision of the South was was an was idealistic, small farms, you know, beautiful, no no pollution, no big cities, uh, rural and simple. So let our workshops remain in Europe and the North means let let them manufacture up there in the North, cities like New York, you know, and Philadelphia and Baltimore. And, and also in Europe, let them have the dirty, filthy cities. We, we make enough money uh, from crops, from agriculture, based on slave labor, that we can buy whatever we need. So you manufacture it, you, you dirty your cities, we'll keep our, our existence serene and buy what we need from you, okay? Uh, Jefferson saw the upcoming Industrial Revolution as a bad thing. 
Uh, so, of course, you have this clash between these two founding fathers that was really inevitable from the beginning. And the reason why there wasn't one party when this country began is because of these two men. Uh, in May of, of 1792, Jefferson expressed his fear to Washington about Hamilton's policies, calling Hamilton's allies in Congress a corrupt squadron. He expressed fear that Hamilton wished to move away from the Constitution's Republican structure and more toward a monarchy modeled after the English Constitution. Uh, and looking back on the comparison, you do see evidence of, of Hamilton's point of view about that. Uh, the same month Hamilton confided to a friend, uh, Mr. Madison, James Madison, cooperating with Mr. Jefferson, is at the head of a faction decidedly hostile to me and my administration and dangerous to the union, peace, and happiness of the country. Uh, so perhaps because of their differences of opinion, uh, Washington made these men <clears throat> his closest advisors. You know, if, if, you're a, if you own a business, so sometimes your managers, it's good to have them have different points of view to keep each other honest and to bring in new ideas. So, you know, Washington may have been uh, forward thinking here. Um, and I mentioned this before, uh, by 1796, political factions had necessitated a constitutional amendment. The 12th Amendment was ratified in 1804. A again, prior to that, the candidate that came in second was named vice president. And I used the example of Hillary Clinton being Donald Trump's vice president. Uh, so it's obvious, or it should be obvious, that a vice president who had just been defeated by the new president if you're going to work together or be forced to work together, it could result in the inability of these two working together effectively. So this amendment changed the electoral process. Uh, president, vice president tickets would be on the same ballot. A vote for one was a vote for the other. You didn't vote for the vice president. You voted for the person running for president, and his ticket included the vice president. Okay. Uh, so, so Federalists with Hamilton as their leader dominated the national government through the end of the 18th century. This, despite Washington's efforts at unity and, and avoiding political parties, these political differences proved to, to be too deep to, to promote consensus or, or, or change or have one party. Uh, the Anti-Federalists with Jefferson as their leader emerged as organized opposition to federal, I'm sorry, federalist policy. So when the country started, it really did have one party. It was the Federalists. But Jefferson and his people started another party, party because they were opposed to the Federalists and they were the anti-federalists. So despite Jefferson's assurance, assurances in his first inaugural address that Americans were all Republicans and all Federalists, the factions had solidified into parties and it remained that way uh, from that time until now. And okay, the relevance of the lecture, the arguments between Hamilton and Jefferson led to a two party system that is still with us today. One more time, the relevance, the arguments between Hamilton and Jefferson led to a two party system that is still with us today. That is the end of supplemental lecture number eight, Jefferson and Hamilton. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on. All right. So I mentioned that this was an era of revolutions uh, kicked off by the American Revolution. Uh, other countries in the world were inspired by America's battle for liberty and independence. And the two main ones were the French Revolution and the Haitian Revolution. And I know we've talked about that before, but we're going to review it here a little bit again. Uh, so we asked the question, what impact did these two revolutions have on America? Let's look at the French Revolution first. Uh, this is where we see the, the rise of a very famous person in world history, Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, so what is this revolution about? Well, it's different than the American Revolution. The American Revolution was mostly instigated by people, men, who wanted more opportunity with shipping and trade. 
and they turned to smuggling they became radical but it was a small percentage of 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 men uh tradesmen men involved in commerce business owners and they they kind of hatched the plan to instigate a revolution and they were successful i mentioned before in the last chapters about the revolution most american colonists were content and happy to be english subjects they didn't want to fight them that that's our people but somehow these instigators got them to do that and you had a revolution the french revolution is is completely different the french revolution truly is a rising up of the of the peasant class against the tyranny of the uh, ruling elite uh you know it was tough to be in 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 france the the uh monarchy oppressed you and you had no opportunity and it was brutal and you know lots of violence and lots of um you know horrible things going on there and in a very selfish and greedy uh monarchy so the french people rose up and the french citizens tore down and then redesigned their political landscape overturning institutions that had been in place for centuries such as absolute monarchy and the feudal system that we talked about a chapter or two ago so like the american revolution the french revolution was influenced by um, enlightenment ideals uh, such as popular sovereignty and inalienable rights uh, let's go to a crash course film here uh, we're actually going to do two of these kind of back-to-back -back. ones on the french revolution ones on the haitian revolution so let's watch the film the French Revolution first, and then come on back. So the French Revolution introduced the, what was called the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. This proclaimed liberty, equality, the rights to property, the right to resist oppression. And this, this sounds familiar. Uh, this sounds like the Declaration of Independence. So again, the American Revolution was influential and inspiring to the French uh but unlike the american revolution the french revolution failed to achieve all of its goals it dwindled into a lawless disordered bloodbath like many revolutions do uh, the people in the revolution turned against each other many times uh and and it it resulted in a widespread hysteria out of control hysteria that quickly swept across the countryside <clears throat> And the common people, the peasants, rise up and angry, striking out against years of exploitation. So they looted and burned the homes of tax collectors. Sounds familiar. Landlords and the elites. This became known as the Great Fear. Uh, but they took it many steps further than the, than the American Revolution. Uh, 1,376 people were guillotined. In 47 days so a guillotine is a contraption that you see here where this blade comes down from the top of this of this uh, mechanism and and goes right through someone's neck and, and cuts their head off uh, so 1376 people in 47 days were guillotine first the royalists then the moderates that's an average of almost 30 people per day <clears throat> I mean, think about it, not to be, you know, kind of uh, macabre here, but that's a lot of heads. You know, what did they do to all those heads? Where do you put all those heads? You, do you bury all those heads? I mean, can you imagine uh, that, that, that job? Uh, so remember the old adage, to quit while you're ahead, okay? okay perhaps a bad, a bad joke, but uh, I'm trying here. Okay, so the French Revolution spun out of control and began to destroy itself from within. The violence and suspicion was totally out of hand. Uh, so this, uh, this agrarian insurrection resulted in an exodus, the leaving of nobles out of the country to save their skins. Um, if you were uh, any, you know, connected in any way to the elite, you're gonna get your head cut off. So people left in, in, in masses. Uh, so was the revolution a failure um, or a success? Uh, well, unfortunately, like I said, many revolutions devour themselves from the inside. So to give an, 
an idea of was it a success or failure, 26 years, almost one generation later, after the Declaration of the Rights of Man, a king once more sat on the throne in France. That's what it was all about, was to remove the monarchy. Yet, 26 years later, a king is back. Since 1793, France has had 11 constitutions, while the United States still uses their first. Uh, so they're, they're constantly trying to you know, change it and figure out a way to make it work while the, the American constitutions work from the very beginning. Uh, the United States developed a government that relied on moderation and political stability. Uh, so these two revolutions were really very different in style, substance, and in legacy. But both these revolutions, one a success, one a failure, both played a critical role in shaping modern nations by showing the world the power inherent in the will of the people even when they lose. So even though the French Revolution was not a success, it still inspired people worldwide and this age of revolution continued, swept into South America. You had many revolutions there. <clears throat> Let's go on to the next one here, the Haitian Revolution. Uh, the Haitian Revolution was the largest and most successful slave rebellion in the Western Hemisphere and it led to the creation of an independent nation, Haiti. Uh, it's very interesting. Slaves initiated the rebellion in 1791. I talked to you before about the French taking uh, men, uh, uh, slaves, young young men, boys out out of the Congo in Africa, and that these men had been schooled in warfare, so they were able to organize and rise up very easily. Uh, so the so the slaves initiated the rebellion in 1791, and by 1803, so 12 years later, long long uh, revolution. They succeeded in ending not just slavery, but French control over the colonies. I'm sorry, over, over that colony. Uh, greatly influenced by the American and French revolutions, uh, this idea of a new concept of human rights, universal citizenship, and participation in government. Uh, in the 18th century, uh, Saint-Domingue, or as Haiti was then known, was France's wealthiest colony overseas made them lots of money in sugar uh, so this is a huge huge loss for france to, to to lose this cash cow this this income source let's go to our next film please watch the film haitian revolutions crash course and then come on back okay so so again the the haitian revolution was in, inspired by events in france uh, a number of Haitian-born uh, revolutionary movements emerged simultaneously, and they used the Declaration of the Rights of Man from the French Revolution as their inspiration. Uh, led by a former slave uh, named Toussaint L'Ouverture, uh, this is the man that rose up and became the, the leader and again had a military background because of, of uh, the Congo. Uh, so a long struggle took 12 years to obtain, uh, but 1804, uh, the nation declared itself independent of, from France and renamed itself Haiti. Uh, France became the first nation to recognize their independence. Of course, didn't have much choice. Uh, Haiti emerged as the first black republic in the world. And uh, is to this day remains the only successful slave rebellion that, that resulted in an overthrow. Uh, so Haiti became the second nation in the Western Hemisphere after the United States to win its independence from a European power. And of course, we talked about the effect that the Haitian Revolution had in America. Would it have any effect? Is it related? Well, it, it is because the slaves in America. American South hear about the success in Haiti and they're overjoyed by it. Of course, the slave owners, the plantation owners, they're they, they are struck with fear. These people are going to be inspired by this and rise and revolt and kill us in our beds. So what's the result? The, the, the plantation owners, the masters, the slave masters, they come down even harder on the slaves and make their lives even more miserable. So a positive thing for the Haitians turned out to be a negative thing for, 
American uh, slaves. Okay, that is the end of Chapter 7, Part 1. Please go on to Chapter 7, Part 2. Thank you.